As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and I've been waiting for you. And today we're going to return to our series, which is called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. And today we're going to see what is the fruit of partial obedience. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, my friends, you will not enjoy the fruit of partial obedience. And if you've ever just been partially obedient, you know the fruit at the end of the game is not what you were hoping for. My friends, we're told in Isaiah 119, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the fruit and the good of the land. You've got to be willing and obedient if you want to eat the fruit of the land. And that means full obedience and partial obedience always results in partial results. It's going to really be good today but I want you to order my entire series, which is called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. Have you ordered yours yet? Why not? This is a series you need. You need to devour it, and it would be a great series to share with someone else. It's 15 parts. It comes in all kinds of formats, and of course, it comes with a wonderful study guide so you can read it while you're seeing or hearing the entire series. And we're also offering you right now my book by the same title, which is called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success, Positioning Yourself to Live in God's Supernatural Power, Provision, and Protection. You can really live there. God wants you to live in His supernatural power, in His provision, and in His protection. And all of those are activated when you're living in the will of God. That really is the key to your success. Now, this is a smaller of my books. Most of my books are pretty big, but this is an easy read. I really enjoyed writing it because as I was writing this, I was thinking about my own walk with God and how I had to process things to get into alignment with the will of God. It's just a practical book, and I know it will really help you locate yourself where you're supposed to be right smack dab in the middle of God's will for your life. But you can order all these things by going online or by sending us an email or giving us a call, and we're waiting to hear from you right now. And when you reach out to us, let us know how to pray for you because we really are a praying ministry, and you will not get away from us without really fervently being prayed for. So you let us know how to pray for you as well. But I'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Today we're going to return to the example of Abraham and we're going to see the fruit of partial obedience. Wow, it's going to be really good. But first, I want to tell you something about our ministry you may not know, and that is about Philip Renner. Philip Renner is our middle son who lives in the United States and has his own ministry. Philip is quite an evangelist. In fact, the reason he is named Philip is because when he was born, God spoke to us and told us he would be a bearer of the gospel and he would evangelize. Well, he really felt the call of God to leave Russia and return to America, and he and his family did that. And now they travel, they preach, and they specifically preach to the unsaved at major events. For example, they go to New York City at New Year's and preach right on the street. It is amazing, and they see hundreds of people saved. They go to Mardi Gras, where they might see a thousand people saved, or they went to the Burning Man, where they saw many, many people saved. Right now, they're in Miami Beach at another big event, just filled with pagans and unbelievers. Philip pulls out his guitar with his entire ministry team, he begins to worship and they begin to work the crowds and people really come to Christ. And I have to tell you that as a minister and as a parent, I'm very proud of the ministry that Philip and his family are doing in the United States and we support it. We believe in what he is doing. And in fact, if you'd like to know more about Philip's ministry, his website address is on the screen right now. You can go there and look at it yourself. You can support Philip or when you support us, you help us to also support his ministry, which is really the ministry of reaching the lost. He goes where other people are not willing to go. He sings and worships in capitals 
on streets at major pagan, unsaved events. And it's amazing how people just come to him by the streams crying when he begins to worship the Lord and they want to know more or they want to repent. And many of them are former church people who want to rededicate their lives to Christ. And Philip is going where only the brave and the courageous are willing to go. But I'm happy to tell you about that part of our ministry that we support very gladly. But reach for your Bible, and today we're going to return to our subject of the will of God, the key to your success. And today we're going to be looking at the fruit of partial obedience. Now, we have covered some of this in the previous program. We're going to cover a little bit of it again and then go on. But I'm covering it again because I believe it's really important for you to grasp what I'm going to be sharing with you today. But reach for your Bible. We always use the Bible in this program. And today we're going to go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, where we find the call of God that came to Abraham. And when you come to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Or we find that he received four divine directives. And notice how simple they are. Number one, leave your country and your homeland. That's pretty easy to understand. Number two, leave all your relatives. That included his nephew Lot which was like his adoptive son. Number three, leave your father's house. His father's name was Tara. That meant he was to leave his father behind and just he and Sarai were to come alone. And number four, you are to go to the land that I will show you. This is very, very clear. Number one, leave your homeland, leave your country. Number two, leave all your relatives behind, including Lot. Number three, leave even your father Tara behind. And number four, follow me and I will lead you to the land that I will show you. But Abraham did not fully obey. At that particular moment, his name was still Abram. Later it became changed to Abraham, but Abram did not fully obey. He obeyed directive number one, which was to leave the country, and directive number four, which was to follow God to find a new country, which God was going to reveal to him. But he violated number two and number three. He brought along with him his nephew Lot, and he brought along with him his father, Terah. And he didn't just bring Lot and Terah, but he brought their families. He brought all of their resources, all of their belongings, all of their livestock, all of their servants, everything that they owned. So rather than just him and Sarai leaving Ur of the Chaldees, just two of them as God commanded, when Abram came forth from Ur of the Chaldees, he came forth with a massive, massive caravan. Now, my friends, we've already seen that when you misconstrue what God has said to you, or you try to figure it out and you add your own interpretation to it, sometimes you really mess things up. But it's very clear that he must have thought, well, God couldn't really mean for me to leave Lot. Lot is like my adoptive son. Who will Lot look to as a father if I leave him behind? So God could not have possibly really meant that. And would God really tell me to leave my father, Terah? He's such a respected man and he's in his elder years. Well, that would be irresponsible of me to leave my father. So God can't really mean for me to leave Lot. And God possibly couldn't really mean for me to leave my father. So we're going to bring Lot. We're going to bring my dad. We're going to bring all their servants, all their substance, all their livestock, everything they have, because surely God would not want me to be irresponsible in regard to Lot or my dad. So the only thing he really did right was leave and follow. He did very wrong by the, violating the middle two commandments, number two and number three. He brought with him Lot. He brought with him his father and all their stuff. Ay, 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 ay. And when he did this violation, it caused partial obedience, which created a mess in his life. If he had been willing and obedient, he would have stepped into the blessing of God much sooner in his life. In fact, we read in Genesis 12, verse 2, the promise that God made to Abram if he would be fully obedient. And here's the promise. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee 
and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, and I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curses thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Notice how many times the word bless or blessing appears in these two verses. And here we find that God is a blesser. He is. God's a blesser. And God wants to bless you too. He is the one who blesses. It's who he is. It's what he does. It's what he wants to do. It's what he will do. It's what he wants to do in your life. And not only does he want to bless us, he wants to make us a blessing to others. But what was Abram's response to all of this? Well, we've already seen that he brought a big crew with him, even though it was just supposed to be him and Sarai. Now, when you go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, it says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Well, he departed, he obeyed directive number one, which was to depart or to leave his homeland. But we've already seen that he was disobedient to the two middle directives, number two, number three, to leave his family behind, to leave his father behind. And we can see that he took with him a whole lot of people. If you had seen the caravan crossing the desert, you would have been shocked. It was hundreds, possibly even more than a thousand people. And it was just supposed to be Abram and Sarah by themselves. But unable to fully grasp that God was telling him to leave his nephew and to leave his father, he rationalized and added his own interpretation to what God said. Hmm, I'm going to go ahead and bring my nephew Lot and my father Terah because surely God would not want me to leave them behind. And as a result, he made a big detour and a big delay in the city of Haran. And we covered this in the last program, but I want to cover it again. If you read Genesis 11:31 in the New Living Translation, it says that Abram, Sarah, Lot, and Terah, and all their big crowd moved away from Ur of the Chaldees. Then the Bible continues to say they stopped at Haran and they settled there. They settled there. Apparently his father Terah, who was elderly, became sick either on the way or when they reached the city of Haran. And now they had to wait and see if Terah was going to get well or if he was going to die. And scholars believe that they stopped and waited about five years, five years. And here we see the result of partial obedience. Partial obedience sometimes puts you on pause. He was put on pause for five years. God knew in advance that his father was going to get sick and that his illness would delay Abraham's process of getting into the promised land. But in addition to that, while Abram was waiting in those five years to see whether his dad was going to get well or whether he was going to die, he also began to preach and evangelize the people in Haran. And he began to gather souls to go with them into the land of promise. And the reason he did that is because Hebrews 11 verse 10 says, God had revealed to him that he was going to find a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He really believed there was a city out there waiting for them that they needed to populate. So he began to say, who will come and go with me? Who will join me on my journey to the city being built by God himself? And apparently quite a number of souls signed up for the journey. And in fact, some scholars estimate that by the time that they left Haran five years later, he took with him somewhere between 3,500 and 7,500 people. Talk about partial obedience. It was just supposed to be him and Sarai. Can you imagine? Can you imagine all the animals that were traveling with him in that caravan, plus all their substance, all their belongings, all the servants, everyone that was traveling, it was camels, sheep, donkeys, goats, parading through the land, carrying untold quantity of cargo. And finally, when we come to Genesis 11, verse 32, the New Living Translation says, Terah lived for 205 years and died while they were still in Haran. And when he died, that's when they begin to take off again for the land of promise, taking somewhere with them 30, between 3,500 and 7,500 people. Then you come to Genesis chapter 12, verse 4 and 5, which importantly says, 
And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and their substance that they had gathered. And it was a lot of substance. And the souls that they had gathered in Haran, somewhere between 3,500 and 7,500 people. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. But unfortunately, when they arrived in the land of Canaan, there was a famine in the land. Well, God knows everything. And God knew that there was going to be a famine in the land. And God knew that if Abram and Sarai came by themselves, as he had instructed them so clearly, they would be able to stay in the land, even though there was a famine, they would be able to feed themselves. But by the time they finally come into the land of promise, now they've got somewhere between 3,500 and 7,500 mouths to feed. There's not enough food. And so Genesis chapter 12, verse 10 says, And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land, which means the number of mouths that needed to be fed had multiplied so greatly that the land of promise during famine could not feed them all. And God knew all of that in advance. He knew terror was going to become ill. God knew that. That's why he said, don't bring your dad. He knew there was going to be a famine in the land. That's why he said, just the two of you come by yourself. But Abraham did not fully obey. Wow. And so he experienced delay after delay after delay. First of all, five years on pause. Talk about a delay as they were in Haran waiting to see whether his dad was going to get well or whether his dad was going to die. Finally, they get into the promised land. They're in the will of God and they can't stay there because they brought too many people. They can't feed all those mouths. So now that they're in the will of God, they've got to leave it. They go down to Egypt because there's no food in the promised land to feed all these mouths. So now they go to Egypt. That is another delay. My friends, do you see all of these delays were the result of partial obedience. And finally, when they do come back into the land of promise, we read in Genesis 13, 6, 8, and 9 in the New Living Translation, the land could not support both Abram and Lot and all their flocks and herds living so close together. When they did finally come back into the land of promise after being in Egypt, that delay, that detour, when they finally got there, their substance was so great, the land could not support both of them. They had too many herds. And so Abraham, being a good man and a peaceful man, said to his nephew, Lot, you go one way, I'll go the other. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. And actually said to Lot, you choose the best of all the land. And the Bible tells us that Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the plain of the Jordan before the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, how it was beautiful, beautiful land. And very near to it, of course, was the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which were corrupt. And Lot said, that's the land that I want. So Abraham honored that and said, fine, you take that land. It was a tragic choice because eventually Lot ended up in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, cities which were filled with perversion and sexual immorality and idolatry, nearly lost his entire family there, was almost consumed in the judgment that came upon those cities. It was very, very tragic. If he had not been brought along on the trip, he would have never ended up in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this shows us how one person's mistake can affect other lives. Adam's mistake, I'm sorry, Abraham's mistake of bringing Lot created a mess for Lot. Lot would have never moved into Sodom and Gomorrah if he had left Lot back home. And we need to understand that when we are partially obedient, it doesn't just affect us, it affects those who are around us. Wow, this is so very important. And I want you to think about your own life and remember that when you're not fully obedient, it will have a ripple effect. When you are fully obedient, it will also have a wonderful ripple effect with those that are around you. But we see this ripple effect in the life of Abram and the effect which was passed on to Lot. But the best choice is always the choice of obedience. And we're told in Isaiah 119, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. And the truth is, every choice we make affects others. And when you make a wrong choice, it often puts other people in a position to also make wrong choices as well. Your disobedience and your obedience not only affects you, 
it affects others, and you can know with a certainty that God wants to bless you. He wants you to see the fruit of your obedience, and that is why it is so very vital that you do precisely what the Lord has told you to do. Say amen. You do not want to live with a partial, with the fruit of partial obedience. So before you act, you need to stop. And you need to say, wait, are we doing exactly what the Lord has told us to do? Are we fudging on what God has told us to do? Because if you fudge on your obedience, it will have a bad effect. But if you're fully obedient, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 119, you will eat the good of the land. That's what God wants for you. And that's what you want. So be sure you align yourself with what God has said. Don't just be partially obedient, be fully obedient and then you will really eat the good of the land. I'll be back in just a moment, but I have something else to say to you. Someone asked the question, Rick, how do you spend your personal quiet time? Well, my life is very consistent. Every morning when I wake up very early, before I ever lift my head off of the pillow, I look up, we're commanded, in Psalm chapter five to look up in the morning. So that's the first thing that I do. And we're also commanded in the book of Psalms that when we go to bed at night, we're to thank God for his faithfulness that day. And when we wake up in the morning, we're to thank him for his loving kindness. So before I ever lift my head off of the pillow, I'm thanking God for his loving kindness and his mercies that greet me that morning. And before I lift my head off the pillow, I pray for our partners. I pray for every member of our family. I pray for a very specific group of people that are very dear to me. Then I go get my cup of coffee and go to my room where I sit every morning to read my Bible. And I begin to pour through the scripture. Sometimes I read a lot. Sometimes I read a little, but I never skim and I ask the Holy Spirit to help me dive deep into the Word of God. Do you hunger to know what God wants to do with your life or what steps to take to fulfill the perfect will of God? Or maybe you need an answer from heaven for a life-changing decision. You can learn to hear from heaven to know God's plan today with Rick Renner's updated teaching series, The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. Rick answers the hard questions about the often misunderstood subject of hearing God's voice and how you can know His will for your life. He shares from his own life how he discovered the will of God and the bumps he encountered along the way. Titles in this series include Coming to Grips with the Call of God for Your Life, Being in the Right Place at the Right Time, Don't Misinterpret What God Told You, Redirecting and Getting Back on Course. This 15-part series is available in digital or physical formats starting at just $24. We're also offering Rick's book by the same name, The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. Rick delves into the journey of the Apostle Paul and other key Bible characters as they sought to walk out God's will for their lives. Along the way in this fascinating process, Rick will reveal vital lessons to help you in your own pursuit to fully align with God's will for your life, which is the key to your lasting success. This book can be yours for only $19. Bundle the series and the book, The Will of God, the key to your success. Don't miss this special offer. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and guess where I am? I'm seated in the foyer of the Tulsa Ministry Headquarters and I love this foyer. First of all, when you come in here, immediately you feel excellence. We wanted it to be beautiful, but we didn't spend a lot of money to do it because we're very careful with the funds that we receive. But the reason I love this foyer is because of what's on the walls. And on the wall, behind the camera, and right over here, there are big displays of letters which we received from Russian viewers in the early years when we were getting so much mail, we stopped counting the mail by the pieces and started counting the mail by the tons. I am not exaggerating when I tell you that we received between 80 and 100 tons of mail from people that were reaching out to us. And we answered every single letter. And you know, to answer every letter, you gotta pay for stationery, you gotta pay for envelopes, you gotta pay for stamps. People don't think about what it costs to answer that kind of mail. But my friends, it was a massive amount of money just to respond to that mail, but we did it because of our partners. And now from this facility, 
we've taken ministry to the next level. We're not just reaching Russia, we're reaching around the planet with television and all kinds of media. And this office in Tulsa responds to people that are reaching out to us from around the world. And because we have this facility, we're able to do this professionally and excellently. And I wanna say thank you for helping us to purchase this facility. You know, several years ago, we started the ministry expansion project. That included paying off this facility and building the new Moscow studio, which was a very big deal. That's finished, that's paid for, and now we're paying off this facility. And my friends, we have already knocked out more than half of the ministry expansion project, and now we wanna completely finish it so we can stop talking about it, and so we can direct our attention fully to taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And if you're not already a member of our giving team, please pray about being a part of the Ministry Expansion Project. Well, today we have seen the importance of being fully obedient to what God has told us to do. When you're just partially obedient, it brings forth partial fruit. My friends, you want the full fruit and we're told in Isaiah 119 that if you're willing and fully obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But hey, I want you to order this entire series, which is called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success, which comes with a study guide and a book by the same title, The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. I want you to walk from where you are right smack dab into the very middle of God's will for your life, where your life adventure will really begin. Amen. But put your hand on your heart, and I want to pray for you. Father, I pray that you would give us the discernment to understand exactly what it is that you're asking us to do, and that you would give us the courage to do it exactly as you've told us to do it. Help us not to alter it or to add our own understanding to it, but to hear you clearly and to do precisely what you've asked us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we'll be back tomorrow. We're going to pick up right here. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, now is the time for you to experience a new life Jesus has to give you. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord, I repent of my sin and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Wash away my sin and make me completely new. I thank you that my sin is removed and Satan no longer has any right to lay claim on me. I faithfully promise that I will serve you as my Lord for the rest of my life. Amen. If you just prayed the prayer of salvation with us, would you please let us know by going to renner.org forward slash salvation. We would love to connect with you. This program was made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. If you enjoyed that teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.